Thank you very much, Andy. And oh, it's so nice to be back here after five years of not being here. And, and I always have to reflect on the fact that I have to come all the way to Birmingham to see all my friends from Scotland. But uh, there we are. <laughs> um, so uh, this is my role. And my role is to work with a team of people um, to help you learn from the BSAC incident report. I'm very proud of the incident report. It's one of the best records of um, incidents in diving in the, in the world, actually. And, it, and it's, uh, it's very robustly and uh, well looked after by uh, BSAC headquarters, and especially Jim Watson, who helps me um, work, do my role as incidents advisor. So, um, let's see if we're going to get go forward. So the incident reports um, come to us from a number of different ways, and, I, and um, they come to us through um, the reports that you all make, um, and um, uh, Paddy help us with incident reports, and all the diving agencies, other diving agencies in the UK help us with the incident reports. Um, they also come to us from the rescue services, from the Coast Guard, the and the RLNI, and the and the helicopter services. So, you know, deepest thanks to them for the information that they give us. We also have a media clipping service which picks up media clippings. Um, we have to treat those with a little bit of caution, but it does help us verify some of our incidents. And as a result of all of that, that, that all comes in. And what you might real, not realize is that sometimes we get an incident that's reported to us in four different ways. The RNLI tell us about it, the Coast Guard tell us about it, you tell us about it, and it's also in the media. And sometimes that's a little bit of a challenge for us because we have to do a lot of triangulation, um, a little bit of uh, detective work to work out whether we've got the same incident or two incidents or even three incidents from those um, separate reports. So we use uh, GPS positions, timings, uh, the harbor that they came back to, the, uh, perhaps the decompression chamber that was used to try and make sure that we're not um, duplicating any of our reports. Um, and so, uh, ma making, but at the same time, making sure we capture everything that happens in the UK. We recognize that we don't perhaps get every single incident that ever happens to you out as there as divers. Sometimes um, you find it difficult to tell us about things. Um, but we do get a very high proportion of all of the incidents that happen. And we're 100% certain that we cover all the fatalities that happen in the UK. So um, we have uh, over 9,400 incidents now in the database. Um, and that's a significant number of incidents. It was interesting to see the definition of incidents that came, come, came across um, in the presentation before lunch. And that, um, that's a very good indication of the sorts of things that come to us through the incidents reports. Um, this uh, plot here shows us the uh, UK-based incidents that are reported to us. They're, the, they're in green, and the blue is the uh, uh, overseas incidents that come to us. Everything that you'll hear about from now on is based on UK incidents, but we do keep a note of the incidents in the um, overseas, and we do report to them in the incident report form because there are lessons to be learned from those incidents. But in terms of... Um, consistency of our data throughout over the years, we just use the uh, UK ones to analyze. Um, in this graph, you can see the COVID pandemic. I've highlighted it for you with a red arrow. And you can see how we, that we had a number of uh, incidents then, but not, uh, it was massively decreased. The amount of diving that we did that year was massively decreased. Um, you can see that there's been a gradual uh, decline in the participants. Um, uh, uh, on incidents in diving since 2011. And you can also see that actually since that time, we've kind of leveled off apart from the COVID pandemic in the number of incidents that we have in the UK. Um, you can also see um, that there's an impact, there is an impact on that and the figure of the uh, overseas incidents. And there's a couple of years where we've, we've had a particularly robust um, number of incidents reported to us from overseas. And a lot of those have been associated with actually quite minor but important uh, mal malfunctions of kits such as masks, straps, and fin straps. 
So um, we, we know about those. So if you want to look at that to learn about kit maintenance, have a look at the incident report when it's published today, um, and you'll see that there's been some, perhaps some kit maintenance needed. Um, so the rest of the analysis that you're going to hear about from now on is all about the UK incidents reports. So um, we are used now to a, a very um, consistent yearly reporting pattern um, of the number of incidents that we have in a year. Um, way back when I started reporting on the incident reports, uh, Brian Cumming, my predecessor, would have told you that we used to have a really big peak of incidents in April and May, um, coinciding with the first bank holidays when everybody was going back to diving. What we've seen, actually, after many standing up at many of these conferences and saying, check your kit, start slowly, practice before you go in the water, do some pool work before you go in the water, we seem to have completely lost that massive peak that we used to get at the beginning of the, in the, ba in the bank holidays, which is a really good thing. So now we believe that this curve that we see for the um, annual number of incident reports is actually just reflects the amount of diving that's going on. Uh, the certain evidence that we see for this particular year, which was 2023, was the, um, the peak of diving that we saw, or the peak of incidents that we saw in late August and early September. Um, so I first, when I first looked at this data, when it came out with my, um, as we did the analysis, I immediately picked up to the phone to Jim and said, Jim, what was the weather like in September last year? And the answer is that um, the first half of September in 2023 was dominated by a huge high pressure system, uh, exceptionally hot days and low winds. So you were all out diving and incidents happened when you were out diving. So perhaps there's also a tendency for us to be a little bit braver. Um, perhaps uh, we're, we're starting to extend our diving season quite a bit, and we seem to be diving a little bit later into the season as well. There's one uh, interesting thing about our diving incidents in 2023 that I haven't yet been able to figure out why and what's happened. Um, and this is our uh, diving qualifications data. So we look at the diving qualifications of the people who are, absolute, who are the subject of the incident. Um, and this year, in 2023, what we've seen is that um, our more experienced divers, our dive leaders, seem to have had a peak in incidents. Now, my first question is, well, have we qualified more dive leaders? Are there more dive leaders in our membership than expected? Um, the answer is no to both of those things. So there's actually not very really much for me to see here in terms of this peak. Um, but it is a, perhaps a word of caution, and that came out in the presentation we heard before lunch as well, that sometimes experience can lead to complacency. Perhaps there's something here to be said about um, just being really careful if, as you advance in your experience and your expertise not to get complacent um, and not to lose, um, lose sight of that. So any other explanations for why your, you dive leaders have been um, particularly a subje the subject of incidents in 2023? I'd really welcome that. Uh, the next few graphs are about our rescue services and how they support us. Um, so here's the graph of our use of the Coast Guard, our use of the RNLI, and our use of helicopters. Um, our use of these support services actually does mirror the amount of incidents that have happened. Um, we can see in all of the graphs the peak of activity that we had in September. You were all out doing lots of diving in September, and the Coast Guard and the RLNI and the hel hel helicopters were very busy supporting you. So a big thank you to these rescue services for their continued support in providing us with the data, but also their continued support in coming to our aid. When we need them, we need them big time, and they're hugely um, recognized for their support of us. Um, one of the questions we're asking ourselves at the moment is, where do our diving incidents take place? And surprise, surprise, the diving incidents take place where we go diving. Um, these two maps, uh, the first one is our incidents overall, and our second one is the incidents of DCI. So we can see... The Isle of Man's missing again, Mary. <laughs> I'm so sorry. The Isle of Man apparently isn't in the R map that I use. And the, but you can see the Isle of Man because of the incidents that happen round about the Isle of Man. And they, they're obviously all due to our, 
our, our newfound Wilkinson sword winner. <laughs> So, um, but you can see here the areas we go diving, Scapa Flow, Anglesey, St. Abbs, Farns, Cove, Stony Cove, right in the middle of the country there. You can see that too. And obviously, a huge amount of diving that happens off the south coast. I mean, obviously, at the moment, we're thinking a lot about how we get um, support for DCI treatment. I think one of the things that we have to take home from this and from, um, from any incidents that happen that... Um, I used to, I used to um, share or live, uh, work right next door to Philip James, who wrote the COMEX tables. I used to go and speak to him a lot when I was NDO about decompression treatment and speed of um, treatment, especially at that time in Scotland, we were looking at um, the loss of the uh, chamber on the Isle of Cumbrae, for example, and all of us were considered worried about how quickly we were going to be able to get to treatment. I think the big take-home message here is um, the window of opportunity for successful resolution of DCI symptoms is about two hours from the onset of symptoms. So if, if you're in any doubt at all about somebody with DCI symptoms, the answer is to get them on oxygen as quickly as possible and get them to the chamber as quickly as possible. So if in doubt, call for help. Don't wait until you're absolutely 100% certain that somebody's got DCI before you um, go to get, seek help. Um, a little bit of good news for you. So this, uh, these are some graphs that we prepare um, using um, the membership of the BSAC as a measure of uh, how, how many people are going diving. Now, I know that that's not a completely accurate way of measuring how, how many people are diving, but as was, uh, Dan was explaining earlier, what is really difficult for us to do is to actually know how many dives happen in the UK every year. But we use the membership um, to give us an indication of the sorts of factors that are leading here to DCI. Um, and it's a, it's a comparative thing, like what percentage of, um, of DCI cases have, for example, dives uh, are, are attributed to dives below 30 meters. Um, these are trend lines, so they're averaged over the last five years. And we can see quite clearly that the number of DCI cases that are attributed to deep diving is on its way down. The number of um, DCI cases attributed to rac rapid ascent, so loss of buoyancy control, is on its way down. And the number of DCI uh, events that are attributed to missed stops are on the way down. Not quite so significantly, um, but they're definitely on the decrease. This is all really good news. This, this tells me that you're diving more safely below 30 meters, that you are controlling your ascents so much better, um, and that you are making sure that you don't miss your stops so much. So that's all really good news. What that leaves is um, other reasons that might be attributed to um, DCI occurring. And th um, the one that's um, on its way up slightly, because it has to, because something else has to come down, is um, those that are involved in dives that are, are repeat diving. So um, there was a, a good piece of advice given earlier on about repeat diving and the need to take um, uh, time out after a little while. So if you're doing a number of days of repeat diving, um, it's a really good practice to take a 12-hour break or a 24-hour break from diving if you can. So um, just, just to give yourself a time to decompress even some more before you uh, hit the water again. Um, so our definition of repeat diving is where there's more than one dive in any day and or repeated days. And I, I fully accept that obviously everybody wants to be able to do as much diving as they can when they get away for their dive trips, but it is a good idea to think about um, whether you can give yourself an afternoon off or a day off um, midweek or, or um, through a dive trip. Okay. Immersion pulmonary edema, um, and I've seen some questions coming up about this already. We've been um, looking at immersion pulmonary edema for some time now. Um, it was first highlighted to us um, in uh, 2010. We started to talk about the symptoms of pulmonary edema and the, what it means for us as divers. Um, with the help of Jim Watson, we've done some further work here, and we've looked at applying some criteria to incidents um, back um, over 20 years now. We're looking at um, the confirmed, uh, confirmed is the red, uh, the red value there, and that's all about um, whether um, a GP or a, a, um, somebody 
uh, in a medic has actually confirmed that somebody has uh, immersion pulmonary edema. Um, the other line, the blue line, is where there are two or more indicators of immersion pulmonary edema. And, um, sorry, the, yes, that's right. And the possible is one indicator. So the possibles are green, the probables are blue, and the reds is the confirmed, medically confirmed. And the indicators we use to s indicate that immersion pulmonary edema might be present is, first of all, if there is uh, evidence of underwater breathing difficulties. Um, the second one is if there are breathing difficulties on the surface. If the diver seems confused or not really quite sure which direction they should be going in. And, and if they're in a, unable to carry out their normal functions when they're under the water. The belief that their regulator is not working, despite the fact after the incident when he got to the surface, there was no apparent reason why the regulator should not be working. It was working perfectly well. And if the diver indicates that they're out of gas, when subsequently it's cl completely clear that the cylinder had gas in it. And refusing or rejecting an alternative air source. So those are the, the factors that we think, or oh, perhaps uh, immersion pulmonary edema is present here. So um, what happened in 2010? Well, actually, we believe that's the point at which um, people became much more aware of immersion pulmonary edema and actually started to tell us about these factors as part of their incident reports. So as you can see, the red incidences of confirmed medical immersion pulmonary edema hasn't changed all that much in the time. But what has changed is that your awareness has changed and that you're starting to tell us about things that have happened that might indicate that there was immersion pulmonary edema there. So previously, we think that those indicators were not relevant. I think uh, one of the questions that came up earlier was about um, snorkelers and wild swimmers. Um, I am a wild swimmer as well, and I was actually completely amazed the other day because I was swimming with friends, and two ladies were swimming beside me, and they started to talk about immersion pulmonary edema. Um, it's actually become really um, a w thing that wild water swimmers are worried about as well. Um, it is a concern for snorkelers and wild water swimmers. Um, so if you are diagnosed with immersion pulmonary edema, as a result of a diving incident, or you think you may have immersion pulmonary edema as a result of a diving incident, then please do seek medical advice before you snorkel or before you go wild water swimming or do swimming triathletes. The triathletes get immersion pulmonary edema when they're swimming on the surface. It's nothing to do with depth. It's all to do with the fact that you're weightless in the water and especially in cold water. So... Um, please do seek advice because the, th the things are linked. Um, so, and it's important not to, not to go snorkeling or um, uh, wild water swimming or anything that involves long periods of immersion in water until you've actually got medical clearance to be able to do it if you have had an IPO. Okay, um, now I've got some more good news for you. So uh, let me think now. It would be... Um, five years ago, we uh, did this analysis. So we looked at... How good are you, good are you at um, doing uh, your rescue techniques? And, and this is actually quite good news. So um, we looked at uh, alternative air source usage, and this is um, where divers um, have used an alternative air source to get their buddy to the surface. And the success rate is defined as where somebody has managed to get their buddy to the surface without um, them separating and somebody having to do a free ascent. So this is a successful recovery to the surface. 83% of the time you, you did that, you succeeded in getting your buddies to the surface. A CBL is where you've used um, control buoyant lift to bring a casualty the to the surface. And success is defined as being the casualty got to the surface. In 100% of the times that you reported to us that you used CBL, you got your casualty to the surface. Doesn't necessarily mean that they were completely okay after that, but you got them to the surface. Um, then we look at where we've used CBL and CPR, and in 33% of the times where you use CPR, your casualty was successfully resuscitated. Um, where you use CPR alone, it was 28%. Where we used oxygen-enriched CPR, you can see that the, increase, uh, the, the success rate was increased. And where you've been using AEDs as well, the success rate was increased. Now, at first glance, these success rates might seem quite small, but they're actually very good compared to a clinical setting. 
A lot of this is to do with the fact that your casualties are, they're fit, they're divers, they've come to the surface for, for whatever reason, um, um, and they're not, they're not necessarily in a, in a hospital setting. But actually, these, these resuscitation rates are incredibly good. So it really proves that your rescue techniques are working well. So um, I wouldn't, uh, I'm always interested when we get publications across the world and other places um, on research into diving accidents. And there was a publication just recently in 2023 um, <coughs> by a chap called John Lippmann and friends, and they published a piece of work looking at uh, diving incidents. They looked at 42 fatalities in um, Australian waters. Um, some of these were commercial accidents, so unlike the BSAC database, which doesn't include commercial accidents. But it was quite interesting to just do a little bit of comparison with uh, UK and Australian data. <coughs> so the Australian paper looked at um, uh, 42 fatalities in five years, and we looked at 120 incidents in 10 years. In Australia, the mean age of those people were 50, and in UK, it was 54. Um, and in Australia, it was 71% male, and in the UK, it was 91% male. Um, in Australia, 26% of, of those divers set out solo, and in UK, 18% of those divers set out solo. And uh, in Australia, it was 73% were either solo or separated, and in the UK, 51% solo or separated. And um, as was talked about earlier, the, the medical conditions are starting to impact quite significantly into our data. And in Australia, health-related conditions were 62%, and medical and IPO conditions in the UK, 53% of our incidents are now linked to medical or IPO uh, fatalities uh, are linked there. So that, that was quite an interesting comparison, that there's not really significant differences between those incidents, especially when you consider the uh, commercial um, nature of the data from Australia, because a lot of the uh, commercial divers in Australia were, were diving alone anyway, so they were actually solo or, or actually choose to be separated underwater because they were, they were doing um, commercial work. Um, but it actually, to me, indicates that, um, that our, our data is not wholly out of line with that um, from Australia. Um, one of the things you want to know is, well, well, how can I avoid an incident that happens becoming, uh, becoming a fatality? That, I mean, that's really important to us. So um, this uh, graph is something that we did um, five years ago, but we're reporting it again now because I think it's really interesting. Um, what, what this shows us is, um, uh, is when an incident happens, the depth that you're at does indicate whether you're likely to come out of it with a DCI or a fatality as a result of that. So if you are at less than 40 meters, then you start to see when an incident happens, it becomes increasingly more likely, um, and this is the red bars, that you may come out of it um, as a fatality, and increasingly more likely that you may come out of it um, with a DCI. Um, so if the take-home message is, um, if something goes wrong, try to be shallow when it goes wrong, because there's a chance that you'll come out of it a lot better off. Um, something that I start to have started to worry about quite a lot um, is how does age is age a factor? And the answer is yes. Um, this is where we do have more robust data about who it is that's actually going diving, because we take the ages, or you report to us, the ages of people in a boat. So if you go out in a rib and there's six of you in a boat, then quite often we get the ages of the other five people um, that didn't die uh, when they were diving. So that gives us an average age of the people that were actually diving who um, to give us a, ball, a ballpark figure. So what that does is it means that we can say that on, a on average, um, last year, uh, we were the people who died were 8.3% older than, 8.3 years older than the people that didn't die going diving. So age is becoming a factor. Um, so another solution um, is to be young. So stay shallow, be young. Um, all right, the next, uh, the, I was also taught as a national instructor never to do a presentation without uh, audience participation. So now we're going to look at 
Um, what factors uh, most likely make an incident a fatality? So I've, you've got um, your phones, hopefully. You can uh, scan that, uh, go to Ask Andy, and you can, uh, oh, hold on, there we are. You can fill in this in and we'll see what, see what you think. Oh, that's, there we go. Are we going to manage this? I'm leaving everybody at the back to help me out here. <coughs> oh, here we go. <laughs> we are getting some results coming up here, hopefully. We did have it for a minute. Oh, is it? Okay. <laughs> How do we know when everybody's answered? <laughs> well, that's a good idea. Okay, come on. There are only 82 of you have responded so far. There's way more of 82 of you out there. <laughs> okay. There's still a whole load of people uh, ranking it. <laughs> okay, are we ready to go? Do you want to hear the answer? No? <laughs> Is it quite slow to get it in? <laughs> Simon, you've got to do this. <laughs> so, you, okay, I'm going to tell you now. I'm going to put you all out of your misery. So you're actually not far wrong, but the factor that's most, that would most likely determine whether you come out of an incident or not alive or dead, is being on your own, whether intentionally or not. So being on your own is like it is the determining factor above everything else about whether or not you're likely to survive an incident. And I, I want to put that, this together with two other things that I've just talked to you about. One is that your rescue techniques are effective. You are really good at doing CBL. You're really good at doing AAS. You're really good at giving CPR and AEDs and resuscitation for the people that you're diving with. You're also, um, the other thing that I was going to say, so if that, there's that. Um, uh, uh, and there also is a kind of an experience thing that I think there's a little bit of us that gets complacent, um, that we tend to go in the water and think, oh, you'll be all right, you're absolutely fine, you're fine. You're, you're you're, um, you're a really good diver, you're going to be absolutely fine. The other thing I want to point out to you is that now 52% of our incidents are medical events. So a lot of our events are cardiac events, our IPO events. They're the sort of events that it, doesn't, it hits people that are experienced. IPO hits people that are really fit. Triathletes get IPO. You can't look at somebody and say, they're not going to have a medical incident underwater. But you, they can only be saved if you are with them. So I'm um, just going to get through here over this. 
So no amount of training is going to help you avoid medical incidents, IPOs or cardiac incidents, but speedy recognition of the symptoms, um, if you have the training, helps. Um, so it helps. So where there is, my conclusions, where there is diving, there will be incidents, absolutely. Um, medical conditions are starting to prevail significantly in our incident reporting. Uh, you know, this, this might be down to the fact that you're actually so much better trained now, your buoyancy control is so much better, everything else is going really well. But what we're not very good is looking after people who've had a medical incident. So when there's better weather, there's more diving, there's more incidents. When, there's, when we've got more members, more diving, more incidents. Uh, if you're diving in a better diving area where there's lots of places to go diving, we have more diving and we have more incidents. But I can't help to but recommend to you to dive with a buddy, and preferably one that will stay with you, <laughs> and not, and not uh, be like a bag of marbles when you get to the bottom of the shot line where everybody just goes in their opposite directions on the wreck. I know I've been there, it happens. But actually, you know, as medical incidents become more and more of a problem that we need to worry about, we can't rescue somebody if we're not with them. And the other thing I would say is that you're really, really good at your rescue skills, but practice and use your rescue skills because they do work and they do make a difference. Finally, I just want to say a huge thank you to everybody that provides us with the data that supports the incident report. Uh, Maritime Coast Guard Agency, the MOD, PADI, Scottish Sabaqua Club, Sabaqua Association, CFT from Southern Ireland, uh, RAID, um, Wade, RAID and Wade, they're quite cool, uh, the Royal Society for the Potential of Prevention of Accidents, my son Ben Peddy, who does all the R coding, because I can't code anymore, I'm too old, uh, Jim Watson, um, Alison Dando for proofreading our report, and particular to all of you who um, supply the information that helps us put this data together and give you information back that supports. Uh, going forward, the incident report um, is on, uh, is on MS, MS Access. I don't know if anybody out there, but Access is a really difficult database to work with. It's not supported so much anymore, and it's, it doesn't lend itself to interrogation very well. We've got an interrogation code in R, which helps us to do this work, and, and my son's really helpful in helping us do that. Um, What's really important is scientific rigor and a knowledge of what the data means in a diving context. Um, but we could really do with some people to help us with uh, thinking about migrating the database over to something that's much more usable, somebody with decent coding skills. Anybody who wants to help with this annual uh, activity that happens, it's a huge amount of work to get it to the point where we can do some analysis on it. Once we've got it to that point, then the actual analysis of it is, is also quite a bit of work. But it's, uh, but it's interesting work because it's, we can ask questions of the database now. 9,400 incidents, you can do a lot of work with that, with that data. But um, thank you very much. That's all I have to say. Thank you.